thank you all uh, for being here. Uh, uh, actually, I see a number of uh, faces that I know. Uh, Toronto, although being a very large city, in fact, uh, has an opportunity to also be a very uh, local city. It has a, an opportunity to be a very connected city. Um, I actually just came from city council where they were talking about how do we get uh, uh, access and uh, to the people who live in this city. And one of the key questions was, well, how about the people who uh, the city sometimes uh, seems to have least, uh, the, the, the most closed doors or the least access for? I said, I'm coming here to Five Good Ideas and you should probably log in and, and take a look at what we're doing because I imagine that both in the audience and, and the conversation today from my colleagues uh, will really uh, reinforce uh, how important it is to take your uh, opportunities and direction uh, from the people uh, that you work with. And it, uh, uh, PARC as a organization, it was built into its DNA when it was formed almost 40 years ago. Uh, the people who crafted the bylaws said that half the board will be uh, people who uh, are uh, using the service or members. And that's still the case today. A little bit about myself because I think that uh, what's important to just as, the f as we acknowledge the land that we live on, I want to acknowledge that uh, uh, we all come with a variety of hats and experiences and mine um, is uh, somebody who uh, uh, grew up in a household with uh, somebody who had a, a major mental illness. Um, <clears throat> I have, uh, so I have a very clear uh, lived experience as somebody who uh, walked that walk with my mother. I have uh, a sibling who is homeless uh, and I have a son who uh, uh, had to use uh, mental health services and has uh, uh, received some support from the system. Those things don't mean that we will end up in poverty, but boy, they sure can lead to uh, poverty being an experience. And so I think that one of the things that I've learned, and especially from uh, my colleagues, is that uh, there's always just such a, a thin line between uh, a service provider or somebody who runs an organization and the people who, in fact, uh, may be receiving service or coming to that organization or group. And so that's at the heart of the work that we do. About 70% uh, of the people who work at PARC are people who would identify with uh, having a lived experience of homelessness, uh, living in poverty, uh, or an addiction, or all three. Um, and, uh, but really, so, you know, I'm sitting here with a, a former boss. Uh, Terrence was on the board uh, from 2003 to 2008 or 9. Yes. And uh, as well, uh, Anne was my boss from 2015 to 2018. Uh, and what's really important about that is that, uh, therefore, uh, our organization, as much as we have really aspirational and lofty goals, uh, half of our board reminds us of what the day-to-day -day issues are. And so inherent in that is the DNA. Uh, I'll start with Terrence, uh, uh, who uh, I met back uh, probably in 2002, I think, Terrence. Um, <clears throat> yeah, yes, but you did meet me earlier at the Gernstein, I remember, in the 1990s, I think. Where we yeah, were so right. actually yes. you can use that mic. Oh, okay. sort of, our, our hope is to really just have a conversation uh, uh, without no PowerPoint. Uh, <clears throat> not going to do any slides or anything else. It's really just a conversation, but I think that the conversation is really about how Park does what it does, and uh, really, the teachers are here beside me. Um, so uh, I've known Terrence. Uh, Terrence uh, started to come to Park, and uh, he'll tell you a bit about how he started to navigate our organization. Part of what he'll tell you is that our organization was, of course, uh, it had doors that were open, or as a a fabulous colleague of mine once said, uh, you know, what's the ramp for mental health? Because, of course, we do a fairly good job uh, of engineering ergonomics and access. But for people who experience the world differently, I think then we need a different set of metrics. And certainly poverty is also one of those metrics that we need to have. Sarah, what do I need to do? Is it? 
okay. speak into the mic. <clears throat> Thank you. So uh, uh, I think that Terrence is, uh, will talk about his experience uh, uh, as he came to Park. And then Anne will as well. And I think that uh, both of them will give you their story of how they've been able to both uh, enrich uh, our organization the many, many people who come to Park, because of course, as governors, but also as in all the other roles, they enriched uh, the experience of the people that we provide support to. And then also the neighborhood and the broader parts of Parkdale and beyond, I think, uh, with uh, who they are and what they do, which I think is the, that sort of, if we want to use the DNA analogy, we're looking at that replicable piece of information that they can get uh, recreated and, and shared across uh, a wider platform. So I'm going to hand it over to you guys for to talk a bit about uh, uh, your story. And I may interject, but if you use <coughs> this microphone and speak directly into it, I think right. is what they'd like us to do. Sarah gives a thumb up. So. <coughs> okay. Um, I first got connected at Park in 1997, for the summer only, and then again in the summer of 99, with one of the Capone sisters, Sandra Capone, and I had a lot of time on my hands, and also um, I, um, I would say that um, Park at the time was very um, small, and there was a lot of smoke, everything smelled of smoke, it wasn't really valid yet. And I, I tried to make an effort to be there, but I, being a non-smoker, I just couldn't. And then, also, I should let you know, I was very, very um, isolated socially from the summer of 1986, happened on the, just before I came to park in 2002. Now, when I, I call this awakening when I came to park in January 2002, it was venerated and I got connected with Sandra Capone and all three Capone sisters, Pat Capone and Diane Capone. Um, Victor Willis uh, at the time, Sandra Capone, and um, I would say also say that um, the secretary at the time, Donna Baum, they all got me involved in doing some volunteer work at, at Park and just getting involved with the center, doing some of the programs, get involved in some of the services I needed. And I, I, I pretty well nearly spent every, every day park was open, I would be there when that opening a park from day to day. In 2003, I eventually got elected to the board of directors at park. I ended up on a number of committees like the governance committee. And then slowly later, I also did some maintenance at park, you know, cleaning toilets, sweeping floors, washing floors, shoveling snow, sweeping the pavement outside the park. And then eventually, I also volunteered as a receptionist downstairs and upstairs at times, and eventually got um, paid work as receptionist from, I would say, 2004 to 2007 downstairs on weekends and long weekends. Uh, I got paid for that. Um, I would say also that um, being involved on the board at Park really got me involved within the Parkdale community. And then I was trained in 2007 and eight as a Park ambassador. I think you most probably know Chuck Tremblay passed away, but he was a good consultant. Uh, we began going door to door when it came to the redevelopment of our social house in Edmond Place, we went door to door, to, you know, along all the residences and also the, the stores. And he told us, us what to do, how to be safe and communicate. And slowly, at the time, I was <coughs> at the time I would say that um, Parkdale. We did have some allies in Parkdale and. Some people who believed in Park and knew about Park, but um, I would say that 92% um, of people were against Park getting a building from the City of Toronto, Edmond Place for redevelopment. But slowly, over time, eight or nine of us ambassadors brought people on board. 
and we went from a state of nimbyism to a state of yimbyism, and um, we also held a Parkdale Residence Association meeting at Park, and then they opened up the membership for the, the association to members, and then they invited me and one other Park ambassador, and a, board, a member on the board at the time, a chair on the board, to be, um, to be on the executive. So I was on the Parkdale Residence Executive for six years. And also around this time, I was also on the board at Parkdale um, Community Health Center for two th terms, six, six years, and also on the board at Consumer Survive Information Resource Center for six years, and then one year as an ex officio member and advisor to the board. And so I, I continued on. I won't speak much longer, but I went on to um, being a housing support worker at Edmund Place, half-time. Then I got half-time work as a community access worker. And then eventually in 2003, 4 I, I transitioned to a full-time community access worker, being a health worker in a way, community health worker. And also, um, since then, I've been working full-time, getting very good pay and extremely excellent benefits. And then I ended up with the union because I'm working full-time, so it was OPSI union. I was auditor for two years for our organization, and then I became the, a trustee, I mean, and also I became, with the union, treasurer of our local, well, a number of agencies, including CODA, and the prison system and um, for two years. And now I'm on the board with Parkdale Neighborhood Land Trust. I've been on that board for a year. I didn't want to get onto any more boards. So, but <laughs> and also on the committee, a hiring committee with them, and also the Community Engagement and Com Communications Committee. But to sum it up, if I hadn't come to Park in 2002, what I did was, because I called it awakening, I was having problems. I, I, I'd, gotten some house, I'd gotten some housing at, um, on Sherman Street near Bloor, in an apartment building, not an agency, but to some extent I found them in streets. Of, um, I'd, my doctor, I was going to my doctor then in the fall of 2001, pretty well, nearly every week, and I asked him to get me a psychiatrist I could actually see and talk to an hour every week. Now I see every six weeks, but um, um, that made a good connection for me. Connections are so important for people, and I don't mean just a connection for a year or two, but a continuing connection continuously over the years. And I've been with that doctor psychiatrist since January 2002, and my family doctor, he's also a psychologist, I've been with him since September 1984. So they gave me a lot of support, including Zan Capone, Pat Capone, Victor Willis. Other members at Park gave me support too. I could say that when I went to Park, arrived at Park in 2002, the members accepted me for what I was at the time and the way I was for the, at the time. And I really appreciate that, appreciate that from the members and thank them. And I st still, when I go in the drop in and to make contacts with members. I, um, I still feel I'm a member of Park. I, I take out my work hat in a way, to some degree, and I'll sit with a member and have coffee or tea or hot chocolate, even a meal once in a while. And I just talk one-on-one, -on -one, and I do not look down on any of my members, because I know what it's like to have had that lived experience they have been homeless in 98, 99, and been on the street and using shelters and, and drop-in centers. And it can happen to anyone, like Victor said, in your family, someone can end up with mental health issues, or emotional issues, or they can become, lose their jobs, lose all their money, become homeless, end up in poverty. And, and it sometimes it's, it's, a, it's a real devastate, devastating effect for people, poverty. It's really devastating that um, what poverty can do to people. And, and also social isolation, too. Um, it's, it's, it has a, a detrimental effect on people's minds, their bodies, 
their souls and their emotions. And but with, with that park, if I hadn't come to park that day in, a, in, a, in January 2002, walked all the way from Sherburn, all the way from Sherburn, all the way across the city. I walked that day, it was a cold winter day, snow and ice, I did have tokens, but I walked and I made it to park and Santa Caponi did see me, I had to wait for a while. But then everything went kind of like this, it went slowly uphill for me. And before I went to park, I never thought I would ever work again. I had my own apartment, get paid work, um, get benefits, um, have a family of eight cats and a dog. <laughs> uh, so, so I have a nice apartment now, and I have lots of toys to play with. I'm into music and writing and singing. Um, but um, connections are so important. And what Park gave me, and all the members and the sister in agencies, like working for change, and also um, uh, some of the other agencies, like um, who has neighbored ours, and also Maytree Foundation, the Building Blocks program, I was one of their leaders in that program, gave me was a voice too. And, uh, getting your voice back is very important after being socially isolated for 15 years, are they having anyone to talk to or to listen to? It's really hard to talk, you know, very hard to just be spontaneous. And now I, I'm quite comfortable speaking in front of you today, but 20, 20 years ago I would not have been, or 21 years ago I would not have been felt comfortable talking to anyone, even on a, on a streetcar, even in a coffee place. Thank you so much. So as you can see, um, I mean, there you go. There's the connective tissue. This is what this is about. Um, Anne, perhaps you'd like to talk a bit about your connection. Okay, I'm going to do this standing up for a minute. You can so probably just can grab stretch. the mic. Be a rock star. All right. I need everybody to spell park right here on my shirt. P-A-R-C. Can everybody do that? P-A-R-C. Now, spell it backwards. <laughs> Go ahead. Right. Crap. That's how my life was before I got to park. Crap. I'm not saying park is crap. I'm saying that's how my life was, crap, before I got to park. My life was abuse, sexual abuse, everything you can think of was abused, no matter what. Um, I came to Park in 2000, almost as long as Victor, but not quite. I won his job, but I'm not going to get it. <laughs> anyway, like I said, that's why I wore this today. When you spell it backwards, it's crap. But anyway, in 2000, when I came to Park the first time, I did not trust anyone. No one at all. When you're abused in every way you can think of, you do not trust anyone. You don't feel safe with anyone. No one. But somehow I made it to park. Someone told me about it. And I thought, well, I'm going to try it out. So it took me a while. I kept coming every day. I thought, I'm going to try this out. If I don't trust anybody, I'm not coming back. But it did take me a while. 
And there was a couple of people that I soon began to trust, very, very slowly. And then uh, I started getting into art, which for me was a way of getting things out on paper. Then the drumming. Somebody was teaching people how to drum. So I thought, I'm going to try this. I love music. Music is in me. But the drumming, it got a lot of rage out of me. Because I could just pound those drums to any kind of beat. And that's what I did. So I kept on drumming. Craft making, I tried it and I liked it. So I kept on doing it. And then there was a writing group. Now I've always liked writing. So I kept on writing and writing and writing until we came up with a book. And it was called Let's Face It. Now, I don't know if everybody knows about that book. They do now. <laughs> <clears throat> and you can still get it. And it took 10 years in the making to get it published. And I sold it and tried still selling it everywhere I go. And it took 10 years, like I said, in the making to publish it. And I sold it at CAMH. A lot of it went to Cam H. I also volunteered for public display of affection and making room. Now, maybe Victor can explain that better than I can. But I also joined the program advisory committee. And I used to teach computers, which is my first love is computers. I love teaching people, no matter what it is, but computers is my first love. I worked in the co-op cred, which I don't know how many people know about the co-op cred, on uh, Dunda or Dufferin and um, Queen when it was open. And I worked in the kitchen there and got my food handler's certificate. I worked in there from 2016 until it was closed. I'm also a peer tutor trainer, still with the co-op cred. And I work at the uh, health center in Parkdale with uh, people with diabetes too, until now. I also applied for the uh, Knowledge is Power course and took that a couple of times. I joined the park board and the caucus from 2014 until 2018. I applied to be trained and hired as a park ambassador and I'm still doing that right now. And I love it. And we're trained right now in, in three different areas for eight months at a time. I just graduated with the local champions in 2018 and now understand human rights a little more. Last, I want to say I'm a lifelong learner. I study and study and study. I don't care what it is. If there's something out there that I want to learn, nothing's going to stop me. The cost might, but I try to get around that somehow. And no matter what, I don't care how old you are, if you want to learn something, it is there. There's library courses for you to take. There's one right now that I'm taking, it's Excel. 
is part of my ambassador course, but it's in the library. It's in Parkdale Library. There's, it's called Gale Courses. And if you go there or look online at Tr Toronto Public Library, there's Gale Courses there for you to learn. It, they're all free. I am a park ambassador, but not only for park, for myself. As a local champion, I just don't want to do everything for park. I want to do it for my community also. When I, like I said, when I first went to park, everything was crap to me. But nothing, nothing could have prepared myself for what I went through with Park. Park gave me a second home. I have had nutritious food. I used to sleep on the street in Collingwood. I don't know how many people know Collingwood, Feversham, Maxwell. I learned school there. I got taken out of school because my parents wanted me to work in a, in a restaurant. I hated it. I couldn't stand of it because of the abuse. Living on the streets in Collingwood, there was nothing in Collingwood at that time. I just lived on the street. I had to make my own way. I couldn't keep a job. I couldn't keep a job because of my mental health. I tried suicide so many times because of the abuse. The abuse was right up until my 40s, and I'm 64 now. But if it wasn't for Park, I don't think I would be here today. So Park gave me a life, it gave me a home, it gave me courage, it gave me safety, it gave me trust. And it gave me some power to take my own life back to where I can reach out and say today, thank you, Victor, thank you, Terrence, and thank you for everybody at Park. Thank you. So I guess we could just go home now. Uh, uh, I mean, Fabulous testimonials by people who, and, and these are just two of the hundreds and hundreds of amazing people who have come through Park and who have helped to build what it is. So when, when we talk about Park and thanking Park, we're really thanking the idea and the idea of an organization that actually puts um, real value in the, that the people who in fact may be perceived as coming for help actually have the ability to help themselves but also to help each other, and that our greatest assets are the people that in fact come through our doors, which, you know, to turn some of the service delivery paradigm on its head, because of course often it's somebody sits on one side of the desk and the, per the recipient sits on the other. We, we know everything and we have all the answers and people come and we tell them what to do. Uh, but of course at Park, uh, we, we try to do that a little differently. Now that's of course partly based on our design, half of our board, but also a commitment to making sure that anything we do, any activity, that there's uh, voices throughout that are, you know, if we're gonna have a, a decision-making activity, if we're gonna talk about what to do with something, inherently there will be people on that committee who are gonna be helping us to try and figure it out. Uh, you heard about the volunteerism that was done. Volunteers are enormous uh, assets for organizations. But the other part is, what else can people, what do people want? And, and how can the organization help them achieve those goals? You know, not all organizations, I was wondering today when, you know, who would be in the audience or who might be online, and of course you could have quite a range of organizations who will be wondering, how do we support people with lived experience? And depending on that lived experience, depending on who you are or what it is that you're, you're trying to do as an organization or a group of people, so it may not be uh, the things that Park is trying to achieve, but I do believe that a lot of the, uh, the 
the five good ideas that we've proposed, uh, but at the heart, from a design point of view, if you design for this, you, you then have a better outcome. And so it really talks about who should be part of that design. Uh, obviously, it should be designed by, the, by and with the people that it's for, uh, because that's, of course, helps with the outcomes then being based on, on those things. Um, I'm, 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 I'm going to look to Elizabeth as far as how much time do we have. We've got uh, the online activity and we've got the, the group activity. Ten? Great. Terrence, I think that you, you did talk about uh, when you came to Park, uh, you, you talked about your isolation, but you also talked what, what had been your, what had been the message, um, you know, prior to coming to Park about your, um, your value or your opportunities for uh, succeeding in life? <coughs> Sorry, I still got a bit of a cough. Um, before coming to park, if I hadn't come to park, I would still be at that, that square one, I call it. Um, when it comes to park itself, I would say that um, my family, a lot of people have just told me, just take the ODSP to welfare. Um, maybe one, one day you'll be... Um, They'll come up with a cure to cure you. And I don't know if it was really uh, more social, my problem, and economical than anything else. Um, like Anne, I did not trust anyone until I came to park, except maybe my family doctor. And even then, I did not listen to him all the time. And, but slowly, that trust was built up at park. But a lot, lot, lot of persons before coming to park has just said, take the house in and take um, the medication and t take your medication, see a psychiatrist once in a while. Um, what else would I say? Um, take, take the money from the government, you know. And um, the other thing I, I think too, besides not only taking money from the government, they would say that um, um, it's very hard to find work at the moment, or even an apartment. So you know, the best thing would just be to to um, accept the money from the government and accept the situation at the time. And um, even my family said that. And. You know, and then also like the social isolation, I no one to talk to, even my family guy that deserted me. And I, w I would say that um, I felt very hopeless. You know, there's no hope, no light at the end of the tunnel. But once I got involved with the Capone sisters and Victor Willis and Park and the members, members too, they really got me involved a lot because they elected me to be on the board of directors only two and a half years after I came to Park full time, um, no, it, was, um, it was very uh, disillusioning, people speaking like that, you've got a disease for the rest of your life, take medication, you have to take medication all your life, see a psychiatrist, take the money from the government, not very likely to work again or do anything again, but I proved them wrong, and I think Park and also the members I proved them wrong because there's lots of members like me have gone on to full-time work or part-time work and go back to school full-time, university, college. Most of my co-workers all have lived experience. They got bachelor, master's degrees, and they got other. When it comes to lived experience, it should be noted also that before there was that diagnosis, people did have a life. They had gone to elementary, high school, maybe even college and university. They had worked. They might have been married. They might have had children. There was other lived experiences they had before be ending up in the mental health system or when it came to well, some people, not myself, but them who use substance users and concurrent disorders and or even just being homeless or being living in poverty. I, I, like I mentioned the other day to someone, 
it, it's interesting to see sometimes it's standing and it's very disillusioning to see that some people are born into poverty and it, generation after generation it's so hard for them to get out of poverty if they are born into poverty live a life of poverty they it's very hard, even there, when they grow up, their children, the grandchildren, their children end up in a life of poverty. And it's so hard. The government has all these programs. There's one program I went to, Redirection Through Education at George Brown College in 95, 96, and 97. They did more than one phase over a second time. But again, you get connected, but then at the end of the program, there's no connections anymore. You're back at square one, except I was able to make form a friendship with a, a professor, and I continue seeing it every so often, every couple of months, whatever, for quite a while. <coughs> and um, she encouraged me to do things too, and she supported me. But a lot of these programs are, they have them, but then they come to an end, <coughs> and there's no um, continuity. The ministry of the, <coughs> the ministry of, the ministry of consumer, the ministry of health and long-term care, and also the ministry of, um, community and social services will fund these programs, but then people don't go anywhere. They might learn something, but then they're back to their social isolation, they're back to doing nothing. And that's they decide to try to go back to school part-time or full-time or look for work. That program comes to an end, and they're back at square one. They have a lot of programs like that, even Employment Canada. <coughs> I think I need to stop now. <laughs> Here, I got it. Okay. I got it. <coughs> Thank you. Um, I, and I, I'm wondering if, in fact, for both Terence and Anne, because one of the other, when we talk about some of the good ideas uh, that uh, are really essential, um, there's opportunities for training that aren't the same as, um, that aren't sort of like our, uh, uh, the throughputs and outputs that often employment programs or training activities are. Uh, and I, I, I think that knowledge is power is a great one to mm -hmm. talk about. Uh, and Anne, if you want to, if you could just like a couple of minutes, we don't have a ton of time left, but maybe just a, a, a few key points about what it is that, that knowledge is power, what happened when you took the knowledge is power program? Um, I can't remember it all. <laughs> no, Knowledge is Power is a very great program for everyone to take if you can get a chance. Um, you learn about some human rights, oppression, um, anti-oppression, um, uh, let's see, um, I don't think I can remember at all. It's okay. I think that what, one of the things that is, that is key to uh, the lived experience is, you know, part of it is that uh, you can give people, uh, you can sort of pour knowledge into their heads and you hope that they retain it and, and walk away. The Knowledge is Power program w was developed by people with lived experience to look at what are the uh, what are the experiences? What are the entitlements as, as citizens? What, what, do, what do I have a right to expect from my institutions, whether that's park, my local government, my city councillor, uh, my bank, yeah. my library? Any of the things that we hold dear as institutions, what are my rights? Uh, what, what can be my rights as far as my interactions with my fellow uh, residents and citizens? What was so important about, about training like that as well is that it, uh, it's under the premise that in fact we all have these expectations or should have uh, entitlements. Being in Canada and, and wanting to and knowing that there are various pieces 
of a framework that create a civil society. And I think that both uh, Terence and Anne, as they did that training, it started to unlock other opportunities. Terence, of course, has been on more boards than many people. Um, he's been a governor of many fabulous organizations. Um, Anne has uh, uh, done a ton of learning and is, a, as she describes herself, as a lifelong learner. And both, I think that both Anne and Terence um, are uh, examples for you here today of people who were told that don't expect much, uh, don't say much, and you should be happy with what you've receiving from our society. I was, of course, that's yeah. of course, I, I think they, they belie what that offer was. And I think that that's really the piece that is uh, the opportunity that every one of your organizations has to help people um, uh, ask for the kind of society that I think that we aspire to. I was, I was told I was never going to amount to anything. I was told I was never going to finish school. I was told that, you know, I was never going to learn anything. But here I am, and uh, I've, I've learned a lot. And it's not just what people give me to learn. It's what I've taken away to learn and, and the knowledge that I've learned. It, it doesn't stop. It's, it's like an ongoing thing. Um, like I said, I'm 64 now and I'm not going to stop learning. I don't care. Like, you know, it doesn't stop. So for any of the groups here uh, representing older adults, this is just the time it starts. So, uh, you know, from a lived experience thing, I think that you know, lots of opportunity uh, to, to make that connection. I think finally, uh, what you heard in uh, both Anne and uh, Terrence talking about their pathway through life and then through park, that, that uh, our, our organization, and there are others, uh, so we're not, uh, we, you know, thanks to Elizabeth to identify that, you know, we, we do it pretty well, but I think that in fact there are other organizations. The, the real goal here is to provide um, various ways for people to um, engage and ask for and uh, provide commentary, critique, and the ability to uh, help you with your organization's aspiration and to, and to meet your mission. Because that's really what you, if you are here, if you represent any kind of group or organization, you have a mission. And the greatest, uh, I think, proponents of your mission are, of course, the people who, in fact, your mission is there to, to, achieve, to achieve for, I would suggest, with. Um, opportunities to volunteer, opportunities to employ, opportunities to talk and critique. Uh, you have them. Uh, you can create those venues. I, I can't, uh, I just can't um, uh, reinforce enough that that's what makes your organization, I, I think, stronger and capable, but also representative. And so these are the, these are the things that are a part of uh, our very modest five proposed ideas and, and some fabulous resources that I think you've also got here. But I really look forward to the conversation that will come from the tables when you think about how do you apply what you have and who you have to some very large problems that we have today. And where, where are the answers? And I think they're probably at your tables and with the people that you work with. Can I just say one other thing? Our mission is about rebuilding lives at park but in our whole community or in your own communities it's not just about rebuilding lives it's about how you deal within your own community about um, trust and um, how can I say this there's it's basically about trust and what you want to do with that trust with your people and safety. Because if there's no trust and there's no safe environment within your community, 
it's going to be hard for people to trust you. So when you get the trust in the safe environment there, then you can go and start from there, I think. Thank you, Anne. And let's, let's hand it over to you guys. <laughs>